you want me to move this? It would help. Hmm. Well, how many of you know what a writer's Bible is? Is it religious? It's not religious. It's not the Bible <laughs> that... Uh, I do not. Anybody ever heard that term? Yeah. Pardon? In movies? Yeah, yeah screenwriter yeah. Bible. Yeah. And it kind of transitioned over into the writing as writer's Bible. So when you go to your publisher, there's a there's a ton of names for it. But but and I'll get through I'll, I'll cover that a little bit more, but I just want to find out how many actually use a writer's Bible? Yes. Oh, well, that's interesting. This can be an interesting group to talk about. So either you're going to think I'm full of it, or you're going to say, oh, that's an interesting idea. I hope you don't think I'm full of it. But anyway, because a lot of people have said that over my career in law enforcement. <laughs> They've also told me where to go, so I have a compass here. And I, you know, but it doesn't face down, you know. So <clears throat> anyhow. So a, 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 Bible, a, a, a screenwriter is, you know, when you see these uh, fellows running around the screen, uh, running around, and they have these products that are all about the uh, movie that they're shooting. And it starts out uh, in a native village in a clearing between the jungle and the river late morning. And it's a long shot of a, a chapel. Does that sound familiar to anybody? African Queen, the movie. So that's the, that's what screenwriters do with it. So it became a little different with uh, writers. And again, what we have is it's uh, any collection or of of concise and detailed information about a particular subject, characters, which we're going to talk a lot about. Everything you need to know about the character, the history, personality, motivation, desires, settings, and other elements, especially uh, books um, for publications. Uh, a lot of the um, uh, editors now are asking people if they have that. Or you come up and you'll try to sell your book and they may ask you, tell me something about your book, about your character. Say your character's name is Tim. Tell me something about Tim that's not in this book. And most people can't, because they never went that far. They didn't, they didn't go deep enough to be able to say, well, you know, what's, what haunts this guy? What is something that is so haunting that he doesn't want anybody to know? And that's a deep, dark secret. And that, being exposed, could actually draw a lot of people into the book, because now they found the weakness now they can relate to that character. Because all of us have weaknesses except Bernard. <laughs> I don't know why I pick on Bernard. I, I pick on Bernard. Bernard and I were in a um, critique group together for several years. So I'm venting now <laughs> on, on things. So anyhow, so it's sort of a reference and a guide. So one of the things, um, how many here have read Tom Clancy? any of his novels. How many here know how Tom Clancy kept track of tons of books with all the military stuff, all the people that are involved, all the backdoor people, the little people in it. How did he keep track of it all? Anybody know? He wrote a book. That's his Bible. It talks about every person, every military unit, every weapon used, every ship, every technology that's going on and it's all in a book and that's what he did and that's his bible now he called it a, a companion a compendium a um, concordance so the name is not as important as no you can't see that. <laughs> that's like he's going to write a book now anyway so the point of it is he kept it and you go through here and you'll and you'll even see pictures of tanks uh, personnel carriers, aircraft carriers, whatever. That's how he kept track of it. And when you're writing multiple stories or you have a series, if you don't keep it, then pretty soon your um, lead character, protagonist, is going to end up going from 29 to 26, and then it's a mistake. Or I have this ship, and it's like 
I was I was looking at something last night that was on on um, some video thing I was looking at. And in the military, they used to have in World War II a carbine and was an M1, M2, M3, and they distinguished different styles. One had a folding stock, one was fully automatic, whatever. And then this gun. They showed this picture in Vietnam, and and I and I forgot all about it. It was a jungle carbine. So well, how do you call it a jungle carbine? It's the same carbine as they used in World War II. Well, they put a little flare on the front so it would suppress the flash, and it became a jungle carbine. So if you don't keep track of all this stuff, you're going to have an M1 A1 without a flash suppressor. So how do you keep track of all? Well, it, it's writing a glossary of something or something that has it. Now, one of, and if I can find it here, I will uh, show you a friend of mine that is, uh, uh, we, we actually uh, um, do panels and teach at the Public Safety Writers Association Conference in Las Vegas. Uh, which is in July, and we teach, and he has seven books out, and it's called The Pot Thief, and he wrote The Pot Thief Bible, and when I was doing a character uh, presentation, we talked about this, and, and I had already had one that I had developed, but it goes through here, and all of his books, it talks about the different things that go on, what changes from book to book, what character changes take place, what storylines, and then he gets into the Navajo and different things about them. So he, he, this is not, you can't get these publicly. He sent this to me and I sent him mine. And his name is Mike Orndorff. And he, he wrote the uh, Pot Thief series and he's got like eight books out on that. But how do you track it? How do you keep track of all this stuff? That's what it is. Some publish it because it goes along with, with their particular book. So if you know the Da Vinci Code and all the series that Dan Brown wrote, well, he put decoded. That was the book, decoded. So that became how they explained everything. And then you have Knights Templar, and they just called it an encyclopedia. Well, it doesn't matter actually what you call it, as I've said. It's, it's the fact that you have it and it's available. And if you write a whole lot of books, that would be another one to put into a book form and give out and sell to your your membership others cast of characters that's actually people put them in the book it's called the cast of characters and it talks a little bit about the individual and we'll talk a little more about individuals and how much you go into that particular individual uh, another one was uh, jd ward and she calls it a glossary of terms and she has that in one of her books. And on a side note, when my daughter was uh, at uh, attending Vassar, she was actually a moderator for J.D. Ward's website. <laughs> so and I've never read any of her books. <laughs> so or I, I never read any of my daughters here. Anyway, and then Tom Clancy also has another one you go out there, and he calls this Rainbow Six. So that was one of his books. If you, if you didn't read it, it was actually a very, very good book. And he talks about the different things and he breaks it down. So this is not unknown in the industry. It is just a matter that um, a lot of people don't use it, but then they start confusing the writers, the things that are going on, places that they're at, or they start mispronouncing, especially if you're in a foreign country. We start mispronouncing the word. We don't have the correct word. So what do you have? What happens? Let me just take one of mine if I can find it real quickly and it's a, a um, it's a hut on Mount Elbrus it's a, a hut the hut is at 13,000 feet and it's before you stay there a night or two to acclimate before you go to the summit which is 18.5 but they had Priute they had Priute with two T's they had Priute with one T but called 11 because 11 died there and they have Priute spelled a different way with 11 then they have the refuge of 11 so what word are you going to use in your book to stay consistent you can't use them all so what are you going to stay consistent so you need to be able to determine that and that's what this is about so I keep consistent in my book because I took one and that's the word I use through the whole thing. And people will look it up and they go, well, no, it's called this, it's called that. 
Well, you can refer back to your story and say, you know, it has many names and include throw a few in there so that you've identified it has different names, but you're using the specific one so it stays consistent through your book. Okay, so let's uh, talk about characters for a little bit. You know, one of the things, I don't know if, you, if, if how many of you get the um, uh, reader, the um, Writer's Digest every month? Does anybody get that? Nobody? You get that? Okay. You get that? Oh, very good. I didn't know you had learned how to read yet. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, has a great article on write what you know. A lot of writers write what they know. So, again, this is when you start taking and you're writing a particular book, it may have a lot of things. The, the story may have to do with you, and it may not. If it deals that you're using your character kind of intermingled in there because you know yourself, then of course, you're gonna, you're gonna wanna, you know, that you can keep pretty straight, but it's the rest of them that you can't keep straight. So, one of the things that I really suggest is, you know, and, and I'll address that a little later, a hundred things, you should know at least a hundred things about your main character. Now, as they become less important, like just a bartender, but he may have a little role in there, if you give him more than a line, you're overdoing it. You know, you just want to identify the person. If there's something in there specific you're going to put in there about him, <clears throat> go ahead, put that in there so you remember it. Because a lot of books, you have way too many, you have a lot of characters, but most of them just come in and out of the picture. It's like the waitress coming here serving coffee. Maybe something happens and she's in your book for whatever reason, and then she disappears. Well, you would only do an overview, nothing specific on her. But when you get to your main character, your antagonist, protagonist, and you may have two protagonists in your book. Some writers are doing that a lot more. So how do you go about developing it? Now you can use a lot of stuff in your own. But the thing is, you, you, you first start out and you want to say, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write everything, a little introspection going on here. I'm going to write a little something on my character, who he is. So you start out first interviewing your yourself. And you write down as many things as you can about yourself. Where you went to high school? Who was your first girlfriend? What was the first thing you remember as a kid? What's the worst thing that happened to you in your life? And you start writing all this stuff down. And surprisingly, when you get down there, you're gonna start finding out you have 50, 60, 70, maybe things about yourself that you're using for this character. Then you turn around and you say, okay, well, I took a deep look into myself. And you can't lie about it, okay? You just put it down. You can shade it a little bit in your book so that you don't tell everybody what a fiend you were in high school or that they're still looking for you, you know, or, you know. <clears throat> anyway, so the thing is, again, um, to write it down and really know who you are. So now I find out who am I? I, I put it down on paper then set it off to the side for about three or four days. Let it clear your mind. And then you go back and you take your list that you have and then you sit down and you interview the person and the person can't lie. So you're asking your character questions now that came up in your mind afterwards and you start writing all that down. Now you've started developing your character. You have the DNA of your character, who he is, where he came from, what he did, and uh, who they are. Now you can start on the next one because you have your all sorts of other characters and you go through. So what I did is, I, this is just like a little hybrid here on a character, on a story. And it's a, it's a Mount Everest view. I mean, you're really looking down. This is not like everything this guy did. Like in the third grade, he pissed off his Catholic teacher, the nun, uh, <clears throat> you know, and said something which made her mad and she took him out and beat him with the ruler until he knew all his math inside and out. Um, so you pick a name. So what name am I going to use? So I use James Jake Grierson. Well, I have a friend in law enforcement who's J James Jake Greer. <laughs> and I, Throw his name in there. That's only for just show and tell. I didn't use it actually in my book, which he had left me. But he's divorced. He's a lieutenant in LAPD homicide, which is where I retired and was lieutenant. 
in homicide. Uh, I gave him a birthday. Who's the birthday? It's not mine. I don't want people picking my birthday up. I gave him my brother's birthday. Let them go find him. <laughs> so I gave him him, where he lived, where he grew up. Um, his, a, then also his ethnic group. So I have this one as Irish Prussians, because back in the, in the 40s, you didn't say you were German. Uh, I'm from Russia, you know, just like I, I am from Persia. You know, so and then Catholic, and today he's non-religious. Well, that fits. Uh, went to Lowell High School. How many know Lowell High School in San Francisco? One of the most prestigious schools in the city. They're ruining it. I went there, and then I went to USC, and went to USC in their international studies. I didn't do international studies in Arabic, but it ties into my character that he does international studies, and he's uh, fluent in Arabic, and he goes into the military goes to Georgetown, gets an MBA in Arabic studies, and he's in the U.S. military before becoming a policeman. And he's with the Special Forces 18th Airborne and psychological warfare. That's a mess with people's minds. And, uh, and he's there during the Gulf War. And I have down here is when he tells people, they ask him, what do you do? So while I was in the military, I do assets. Oh, okay, well, that doesn't mean much. Well, yeah, you know, in the military, they have all these assets. So I'm saying, so what is assets? Well, let me see what I can get to. Assets. Army Special Operations Strategies and Execution Team. Oh, well, that's a little different, isn't it, from assets? Yeah, assets. It's easy to tell people, and they're thinking something else, and you're not taking it away from them. You're saying, oh, yeah, yeah, just that. But you actually go out there and do um, military operations in foreign countries. And then I put in my second protagonist, who's his girlfriend, not in my novel, but in this setup. And she's uh, uh, brought the same age. She's divorced three times, so she's a three-time loser. She's a captain, but they call her the Ice Queen. Um, she's on LAPD also, and she's from Quebec. So trying to balance out the uh, <clears throat> um, ethnicities. She's a Native American, Eastern Creole, free male of Franco-Canadian background. <laughs> so I, got, I cover a lot of different people in there. And then she went to school in Quebec, UCLA, but she studied at USC also. So you see how they become lovers. So you see how they connect. They're both in a police department. They both went to USC and they both work. They're workaholics in a sense. They don't have time for for marriage and whatever, so it becomes convenient for them. So that's how I set this this group up here. So the next thing is uh, going into, uh, let me see, I had some questions about this time I was going to ask, and I think you answered that. Hey, Mike, that can I ask you a question? Or you wait till the end? No, you can ask a question. I, I, I've just been waiting here for you to do that. <laughs> well, Larry and I have been friends for you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Know. Anyway, go ahead. Um, it makes so much sense and I've never heard of it because I haven't been doing this long enough, but what the feeling I'm getting when you're going through this is if it was me doing it, I'd say, how do I get all this stuff in my book? So the question has to do with, you put all this stuff down and I get that you're keeping track. All of that makes sense to me. But it's like, now I've got all this data that I've created and I want to put it in there somewhere. Did you experience that? Because you made it clear well, yeah. it doesn't necessarily let, let, all need to be in there. It doesn't all need to be in there. But if you're doing a series, you can show up in the next series. Or two. Or three. It's like my friend. Um, and it doesn't make you crazy to like have that data and not write about no, it. No, no, it doesn't. Does, no, uh, no. See, crazy. this would make you crazy. <clears throat> That's why I developed, especially for you. <laughs> you go crazy. You. Woo, woo, woo. Uh, and we'll have them talk about it. It also, it, you don't have to put all that data in your book, but it, it guides you as an author of how to, of what the character is oh. going to do in given certain circumstances. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You're creating something from nothing. Yeah. And it's right. like actors when they put themselves in the role on the stage. You've got to have all that, even though it may not be yeah. part of the, part of the actual exactly. action. It's just yeah. Well, you, you may do something that has that's in there that 
is not exactly what you're saying you're doing, but your gesture, you know, like being non-religious and you're going by and you go, you know, and you do a roll of the eyes right. or something. See, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be in there. You know, you're not trying to beat your audience and say, well, I don't want any Christians to read this. But, but the point of it is, you, you've got it there. And as you think more and more about it, you know, you would then add that to your list. You never know when you're going to use it. But I just sat here and I wrote stuff down and I said, that's great. I'm going along. I've got some guy down over here that's fitting into this story. And I go, you know, that rule about this, that, or the other would fit this guy. So I take it here and I put it over into his genre and it works out. So it's not just your own. You can transfer these things around. It's not a set list either. <clears throat> so you can kind of move this stuff around. In the case of Tom Clancy, we learn more and more about Jack Ryan oh, yeah. as we go through the series. Of and it seems like mainly the circumstances and the scene changes to fit the new story. Right. But we know the background somewhat from prior readings right. about who Jack Ryan is. Right. Well, when you went through Clancy's books, you get into, you know, some of all fears and some of the others, and they have, you know, uh, Ryan in there. I mean, this, this guy is in his... 50s, 60s, he's, he should have been retired, uh, and then you go to the new series, and it's some guy that's in his 30s, John, I forget his last name, and it's a great story, but you have to divide it out, it's almost similar to when you did Star Wars, now you have different actors at different age brackets, and you have to say, okay, that's kind of set over here, versus maybe, you know, his Rainbow Six, is this book, that book, Hunt for Red Ark or whatever. So you kind of move it around a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But like I say, a lot of these things, when you think about them, and you talk about another person that's in your book, that it might fit them also. So it's not specifically that, no, this guy likes roses and nothing else. Well, well no, maybe you're thinking about it. Maybe you don't use that in your book about your protagonist, but maybe this guy has a rose collection. Um, <clears throat> What was that? The guy Snow in uh, <coughs> Mockingbird, you know, had the roses and the white roses and all that. So it could fit anywhere. It's just that when you write it down, you you have it somewhere, and it, and and it and it tweaks you, and you go, hey, I'm going to go here. How many use? Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah. Um, how many? How many do storyboards? You do. Okay. You do. Okay. How many know what a storyboard is? Okay, but you don't use one. Okay. I, I do, you know, it keeps me on track. And, it, and it's hard, uh, hard to see, but that's what my storyboard looks like. I've got a whole lot of stuff that I throw up on it and to see where it fits. And then it's in front of me, so when I'm sitting there and I'm trying to say, I want to talk about the dacha, because in the book I write, it uh, centers around a place called Mount Elbrus. Does anybody know where that is? Mount Elbrus? Anybody? Well, you do, because you told you, yeah, I told you. <laughs> but it took how many sessions? So anyway, uh, Mount Elbrus is in southern Russia. And it's the highest peak in Europe, except if you're in France. They think Mont Blanc is. That's only 3,000 feet shorter. So the French think their mountain is bigger, but it's not the biggest in Europe. It's the biggest. The biggest in Europe is Mount Elbrus. And so my story takes place there and a little bit in Moscow and kind of a little bit here and there. So I have the storyboard because I'm all over the place. I need to know Russian towns. I need to know um, dachas. Does anyone know what a dacha is? Besides you. <laughs> A dodge, you know what a dodge? Okay, it's a summer home. And they used to make these uh, dodges where the leaders would go to. The one I stayed in was in uh, southern Russia. It was for the cosmonauts. And what they did is, after all their training, they would either take their wives, mostly didn't take their wives, they took their mistresses. And it was a big party thing. 
Well, when Russia changed in at the uh, 1991, these things all kind of went out. It's not like the new government kept it and all the astronauts got to go over and party here. <clears throat> they started renting them out. And fortunately, when I was in southern Russia, I stayed at one that was for the cosmonauts. Uh, I call it in my book a different name, but basically it's a... And this is the picture of it. It's just like a summer home where they have eight room, eight main guest rooms that was for the cosmonauts, but they also have big kitchens in there and then they have the maids quarters and stuff like that. Well, that center room right here, I spent 10 days in that room. And that's why my story is taking place. Some of it takes place in that room because I spent 10 days there and it's still burned in here. And so I can describe it without a problem. Of course, then I, I, I uh, photographed a few of it too. And so it makes it uh, interesting. And also Pryute, which is the, um, it looks like a Airstream, but you know, it's a big hotel and it looks like an Airstream put on the ground, take the tires off, and that's what we stayed in before we actually summited up to Mount Elbrus, and that's what's called Pryu. So, you know, having those things and writing about those, and, and that's me standing on top. Uh, so, again, having all that, you know, makes it a lot more for me. I could put photographs up, I could put different things and, and describe different things and how to keep. Now, for, for your writing, when you're using a different city, a different state, and a different country, how many of you actually travel there? Okay. You went to Spain? Spain, Italy. Okay. Break. Oh, okay. Yeah. In all those. <laughs> Who else? Who else? Okay. Scotland? Where? Scotland. Scotland. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. I mean, and, and you take a lot of good notes, but when you research, you try to find out what they used to say in that time period of your story. Not what they say today. And that's the big one is, how did they talk? What did they say? What did they call things? Well, when I was in Southern Russia, it was 93. And as a result of that, there was mass confusion. It's all I could call it is the land of broken toys. And the reason is that it's like taking the United States and say it doesn't exist anymore. And you go, oh, really? Uh, well, wait a minute. Who owns all this stuff the feds own, the buildings, this? And you go, well, we haven't figured that out yet. Well, what's in California? California owns it. Oh, not so fast. I was put in charge of this. I own this. Well, until someone knocks on your door, you might own it. But the point of it being is that when you do that, and then you go there 18 months later, it is really mass confusion. Nothing is operating. This is really the land where uh, the, the Russian mafia was in total control. The government was in such confusion that and nobody knew who was paying who. It was really an interesting period of time. I'm glad I went at that time because uh, it, it was very, very interesting. And we spent about 10 days uh, in in the dacha, but also we had another week around the country. Was this uh, after Gorbachev? Uh, yeah, yes. It's when Yeltsin came in. Correct. And the only thing I can say about Yeltsin is that he was never sober as a leader. He was a constant drunk all the time he was in power until he finally was. So, when you talk about story, you know, I mean, I story. You story. Yeah. You have a lot of anecdotes there. Correct. But, but what I was using it for was somewhat of a, when I storyboard, there's a chronological underlying aspect to it. Sure. And then there's, there's connections that go to other things. And what you look, what that looked like to me was just a bunch of data on the line. Do you have? Correct. Did your storyboard have 
a different specific flow? Or is there something specific about how you go with storyboards? No, that comes from the writing part. But when I'm looking at stuff and I'm trying to make description, say, of the doxha, I just look up to it and I start writing what it is. And then sometimes what I do is I write out what it is, only so that I keep consistency. I don't want the color to change from a creamy white to a, to a, a light yellow to a, a light blue, which are the three main colors of every building in Russia. And so, you know, you keep track of stuff, and that's what I use it for, is to track so that I don't, I don't, I don't mix the ages. So it sounds like there's no necessarily chronological flow. No, okay. no. It's keeping information. And the same thing with Mike Orndorff when he did the Pot Thieves. He's got it a whole different way than I have it, but that's what works for him. And that's the idea of the whole thing. It needs to work for you. If you wrote it like mine, then you'd have to have a mind like mine, and by God, you don't want that. That's right. Yeah, you definitely don't want that. Yeah. I know he doesn't want like that. So the other thing is, how do you keep track of all your characters to know who knows who throughout your book? How did you do that, Tim? You know? Okay. One of the things I do is when my characters talk to me. You know, they'll say some weird tone of phrase, you know, sign of his or something that was kind of work. I put that in. So it's kind of like a little story. Right. How did you do it, uh, Baron? I kept notes. Um, the concepts of what you're talking about I used, but in a different way. Correct. So there were like bits of paper all over the house, which I had to, Correct. I had to go find because I yes. couldn't remember. It. Well, when you start a book, I buy stock in. Stickies. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's um, <coughs> what we're talking about. Now, one of the things that we used to do in law enforcement, and then when I was in healthcare fraud, is how do you track all the players in your in your say in your homicide if it takes in gangs where there's multiple people, and this is called link analysis. And this is what I do for my book. What I do is I have all my characters on the lower right hand, right hand corner, and then I connect them. How do they connect to each other? And then sometimes you have them off on the far left, but unbeknownst to you, they're connected to somebody else that nobody knows about. And then you draw a line to them. This is used, I took a course on it, on this, it was really interesting because it was put on by the CIA. <laughs> That's how they used to track all the uh, Russians in the Cold War and all the Chinese and so forth. So that's a little something I picked up, and that's what I use also. Hey, Mike. Could hey. You, yeah. Could you show those uh, papers to those of us on Zoom? Like, just hold it up in front of the camera. So, uh, where is the camera's here? So the camera is yeah. there. So, Mike. Oh, you don't have to get that close. <laughs> Pull back a little bit. There you go. Okay, thanks. That's it's just little circles with yeah. your main characters, and then it's connecting them. That's like, nice well, how see. do they connect to each other? Right. Thank you. And, and you want to make sure everybody connects to somebody, or you don't have much of a story. <laughs> right? Yes. One of the tools that's commonly used to do that something that it's called an entity relationship diagram. Yeah, or yeah. ERD. There's a whole lot of machines. There's a, there's a lot yeah. of names for it. Right. But just for the people in, that are listening to this, if anybody struggles to find out, I'm sure you can help them find tools that I can help. Yeah, there, there's a ton of tools out now to that are used in the industry. Uh, when I worked healthcare fraud on government contracts, we had similar machines. Now there's new technology that has come out, and you can trace anything from that's i mean the fbi doesn't look this up in a little index card in a the library they've got machines where you know all the phone numbers populate all the addresses populate the names populate uh, what they do populate everything populates and what you do is you get an end product it pretty much tells you what's going on what the point is so let's talk about you know characters a little bit here and uh then I'll go back to the other part. And so what I look at is, let me see if I can get, uh, 
I have a list of what I call um, 100 things you should know. And what I do with this, what I've done with this list is I wrote out for my character what, what I should have. So what I cover is like, well, what's the nickname? I mean, in your, in your book, you know, there could be a nickname, you know, Slim, uh, Plain Jane, Payaso, Kimmy Bear. I mean, it could be anything. So what I do is I kind of write down what the nickname. In, in my particular book, it's LT for Lieutenant Colonel and also for Lieutenant with the police department. Role, protagonist, uh, as a hero, heroine, birthdays, where were they raised? Uh, what's their gender identity, gender? Um, what's their ethnicity, uh, religion, marital status, children? And it just goes on down and there's a list of a hundred things here of which I wrote for my character. I have a list I'll hand out, which has just like what are eye colors. You have to figure that out. I'm not going to give you my list because it took a long time to put this together. But once you see it, you'll realize that these are things, these are just simple things you put down because you don't want to have your character show up with being blue eyed or one green eye or and have a brown eye that turned green or you know I mean it doesn't make sense so you want to keep track and, and make sense of that and what I have on a handout sheet is uh, I pardon the font but I want to get it on one page because uh, Bernard is too cheap to pay for it so it's it's listed but use a magnifying glass it does have a hundred and then on the back it has uh, spaces like you can put down uh, log lines, characters names, um, locations, date, time, storyboard, bench points, whatever. You, you, you can do that and it'll make it a little bit easier in tracking. But this is your um, Bible or glossary, whatever you want to call it. It's yours. It's about your book, your characters. So when you do session uh, or book number two, three, four, or five, and you use them some of the characters, remember you have to take the next one and you have to update the ages because now they're a little older. There might be 10 years between book one and book two, like in some of the Jack Ryan stuff. So you have age difference. Well, you have to age it. You still can't have your 39-year-old guy if it's 10 years later. You know, that the math doesn't work. And if somebody likes your books, they're going to say, wait a minute, he was 39 in the last book. And you know, on a lot of these things, you have too many errors. And you know what happens to your book? Wouldn't read it in a million years. It just gets, it's not the confusion, because you can have that within your book, it gets really technical. It's the fact that none of your stats are correct from one book to the other. So people are going to disregard it, they're not going to read it, and you're going to lose readership over it. So that's one of the things that I use this book for. And again, uh, this is personal, but I am going to do a um, series on, uh, or, or write about, a lot of the stuff that I talk about, it's going to come out. Uh, maybe after I finish this book, it'll be my next one, because it's real easy. I already have it mostly put together. And I go through my characters again, like I say, and I'm, you know, a lot of them, in, 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 in policing and in military, I'll, I'll, there's a high divorce rate, you know, just like Hollywood. Well, Hollywood, I think, you know, it's whoever's popular at the time, you sleep with them. Then when they become unpopular, you move to the next popular one, you know, hoping to, you know, that if you stink as an actress, you'll be actually either a housewife or a house husband, you know. So it goes through and I cover, the, cover a lot of that stuff, but it also gets a technicality. When you start researching all your stuff, you find out a whole lot of interesting information about the area you're in, the country you're in. Um, the specific areas change in Russia. You get down on the southern border, and there's a lot of stuff that comes across the Black Sea, either from Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania. But you're up in up in uh, Moscow, and when we were there, we went uh, at the hotel. They they fed us dinner, and I'm going to tell you, it, it was on a small bread plate, and that was dinner. There was hardly nothing there. So we went over to the McDonald's that was there, and you go to the McDonald's. And, and the Pizza Hut, too, was there. So we, we'd go to McDonald's and a Pizza Hut to be able to eat. <laughs> so uh, we were at the uh, Pizza Hut, but if you eat inside, you have to pay in U.S. dollars. 
if you just want to get a piece of pizza outside and you have ruples, you buy it outside. There's no place to sit. You get one piece and that's it. And you pay in ruples. But inside, it's all dollars. They take no, no exchange money. So when I landed in Russia after the fall, the ruble went to uh, 10,000 to one. So I, I, I cashed $10. And by the time I got to the airport to go home, I still had nine dollars worth of their currency. And you know, and when I was there, there's a lot of street bazaars. I have a, a, a foreign currency collection, so I had actually purchased some foreign currency collections, and I was taking them out of Russia. And the guy there says, "Do you have any Russian currency?" And I said, "Well, I have this." And I showed him, and he says, "Well, you can't take that out." See, I wasn't talking about the stuff in my briefcase. And I said, so what do I do with it? He says, well, buy me and my friend some cigarettes. <laughs> I said, sure, that's not a problem. So we went out. Nothing was open because it was early morning getting a loose stanza. He said, he'll watch your bags. I got back. Never got checked. Nothing. Went on the plane, out of the country with <laughs> a large collection of Russian currency dating back beyond the czars. So, it, it, you know, and I gave it to him. I said, hey, in American friendship, since we're all friends now, you buy your kids a present. And I gave him $9, and that was half his salary for the month. So I was popular, you know, and then some guy comes down, this kid, the military, and I thought I was going to get jacked right about then. He says, please to present me your pen, because he didn't have a ballpoint pen. And, of course, I had these freebies from the city of Los Angeles. You know, city of Los Angeles. So I said, oh, yeah, by all means, take it. You know, I got on a plane, landed in Frankfurt, and said, I hope it runs out of ink. But anyway, <laughs> but, but again, this is, um, you know, writing about different things. I, I made up the hotel. It's the hotel I stayed in in Moscow, actually, but I moved it from the outer ring. I moved it into a corner of Moscow, and I don't know if it's sitting on top of a laundry or whatever, but it's on Red Square where Gums is across the street and the Kremlin is down the street and um, things like that. So what I did is in the back, I have, you know, so I don't forget where I put these things. I actually have um, maps in there of the um, Moscow Center. And, um, and what I did is I just put my little hotel where I needed it. So I could say, you know, I was left, right, north, south, or whatever. I could look here and see, yeah, okay, I know which direction I'm at. But it's a description of the hotel that I actually stayed at. <clears throat> and then one of the other things that I had in that, which I was thought was really funny, a, a situation comes up where, um, no, I'll tell you, you have to read the book for that. Anyway, so there's a number of things I put in here about <clears throat> the Russians and others. Am I about... Okay, um, we can start with questions, and I'm sure that there are maybe a few. I hope there's a few. Do I have a few? Do I have any questions? Here, I would like to do, before we go too far, is Bernard and I spent a lot of years, he knows this book because he got to read every chapter, every redone chapter, and everything else. But because of, of that, it's a minor remembrance of, you know, a lot of fun that we have. He's really a good uh, critique person to have on there. But I just wanted to give them a, it's a Russian currency, and it's from 1993, when it took place, and this isn't worth anything. <laughs> but I wanted to thank you. It's you know, 500, you can, though. It's 500, yeah. And, and 500 won't get you anything in Moscow, except you have to pick it up off the street. <laughs> but, but at the time, the U.S. dollar was king, and it was really great being there because I mean I've bought different things at you know police hats and stuff like that and transport all this crap back home and when I had to redo my house about a year ago uh, I, I don't know why I still had it but I still have it <laughs> anyway so uh, are there any other questions on this um, topic yes did you bring any books for sale or are they available yet no not yet I, I, I I'm still working I had medical issues for the last two years and so there's some brain fog in there and a 
few other things, but it's we're getting there. We're getting but I there. highly recommend reading it, uh, especially if you like body parts. There's a lot of body oh, parts. there's you know, it's a techno thriller, and it's in it, and it has it has a it's not as bad as an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, okay, where he just kills it if it walks. I let actually people live if they walk, it's if they talk. <laughs> so, anyhow. It's interesting because, again, I took a lot of my homicide stuff in there, my police experience, past military. I put it all together. Uh, I've met Russian police officers. I did a lot of research. So it really, it, it was more fun writing the book. I had more fun doing it than probably I will have publishing it because it was a lot of fun. It was a great experience to do this, to just sit down and put out thousands upon thousands of words and put in stuff that had taken place when I was in the Los Angeles Police Department. And there's a few things that are a little graphic, but I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and you'll have to read it to figure it out. Okay, is there, are there any other questions or I'm through? That's it? Part of the book is called Ice Killer and Brandon Michaels is the uh, name that I use as an author. It's my, you know, writing name. And, and the reason is, because of being an LAPD, I didn't want to have my real name on it, not for fear that any of these stories, somebody would say, well, that was me, because it really isn't. But the fact is, I didn't need anybody tracking me down from Folsom Prison or, or, or San Quentin or some other location. You go, oh, yeah, now I know where he lives, you know, and then put my life and my family's life in danger. So I write under another name, which is interesting, because it's the name I use for my private investigator's license in my corporation that I've had for 29 years. So it's Brandon Michael, under Brandon Michaels. It's a play on the name, Brandon Michaels Michael. Who got it? Took me a while to get it. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. It's been fun coming up here. Um, if you have any questions later, you can email me. I, I don't send the book out because that's personal. I'm not publishing it. But you know, in time, if I have three, four, or five books like um, Bernard has, then, then I might consider doing that. So it helps the readers stay attuned to different things. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Pardon? Yes. So um, if I can get someone to hand these out, please don't leave them if you, if you look at it. Don't leave them on the table and let me have whatever is left over. So I, I give these as quizzes to my, my wife when she has nothing to do. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Hey, it was fun. I hope you learned. Yes. Good. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Hey, look at this. And we will see you next time. Okay, thanks, folks. Um, same time next month. Thank you, Bernard. We really you appreciate as well. it. And stop recording. Did you? Take care. No, I'm trying.